thousands of people have mysteriously vanished in America's wilderness. Join us as we dive into the deep end of the unexplainable and try to piece together what happened. You are listening to Locations Unknown. What's up, all you cool cats and kittens, and welcome back to another episode of Locations Unknown. Uh, I am Joe Arado, and with me, as always, is a guy who can do a wheelie on a unicycle, Mike Vandebogart. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in once again. Um, don't have any updates for you guys this week. It's It's been pretty slow with the pandemic. We do have a shout-out for this week's episode. Um, a guy emailed... Uh, our website. I uh, don't know his name other than from his email, just so Charles recommended uh, this week's case. So thank you, Charles. Yeah, Charles, some numbers in hiking. So maybe yeah. his <laughs> name's Charles Hiking. Who knows? Yeah. So thank you once again. No updates, Mike. What have you been doing during this pandemic in your house? Uh, crawling the walls. <laughs> um, I, I Thankfully, I'm still one of the uh, few that are still employed, but uh, outside of working, uh, just cleaning up around the house i've got some you know projects outside but it's been really boring <laughs> yeah I'm, what about uh, you uh, just I, I i have a lot of kids so that's pretty nuts so you might yeah. even hear them in the background because they're all going crazy and uh, i'm getting <laughs> really really good at Warzone. so <laughs> <laughs> call of duty yes <laughs> so mike just started playing so he's not that great yet but we're gonna get him no there. i'm and, terrible and i actually i used carol baskin's intro i've never seen that show and i'm very proud of that so I feel like I'm a little bit smarter than the general population who has seen it. Well, you have to watch that uh, documentary on Netflix. Nah. It's wild. Is it really no. a documentary, though, or is it like an after-the-fact reality TV show? It's like a human car crash. <laughs> <laughs> is it in Florida, or what state is it in? It's in a couple states. Florida and, I think, Oklahoma. Okay. Sorry to I the listeners in Florida. I just assumed it was a Florida thing. <laughs> from pictures my wife has seen it and she loves it everyone that's seen it has loved it i i'm not interested but anyway let's uh let's just get into it yeah let's do it all right everybody let's gear up and get out to explore locations unknown October 5th, 2018, Terrence Woods, a freelance filmmaker, was working with a production company, filming a reality TV show at Penman Mine in western Idaho. While the crew was wrapping up, Terrence jumped off a cliff and sprinted into the thick mountain forest, stunning the entire crew. Before anybody could respond, Terrence had disappeared without a trace. What caused Terrence to run into the wilderness? Join us this week as we investigate the disappearance of Terrence Woods. Penman Mine is located in the Oro Grande area, which is part of the larger Nez Pierce Clearwater National Forest. And Mike, if you remember, we kind of touched on this case a little bit, which is why we decided to do it. You got that email from Charles, and we made a quick mention of this case because it coincided with the disappearance of our last sh- not our last show, two shows ago, right? Yeah, it was episode 20. So, uh, Strangely, um, Connie went missing four hours after Terrence was declared missing. So yeah, very so close. We, we commented on it because there are some theories about the connection. And it was compelling enough that 
I think we even mentioned in the show that we're like, hey, we're going to do an episode on this. It was compelling enough that we wanted to do a whole episode. And really what the straw that broke the camel's back was the email from Charles. So again, thank you, Charles, for this. So I'll just keep talking about the uh, National Forest. It's in Idaho County, a mountainous 8,500 square mile region of western Idaho. So Nez Pierce is actually 2.2 million acres of U.S. National Forest located in west central Idaho and is made up of four separate wilderness areas. It's huge, and it's frequently listed as one of the most remote places in the lower 48. Yeah, I think I remember from the last episode, it's like some of the most vast, untouched, thick forest area in the lower 48. Because, I mean, Alaska just doesn't count. Uh, But in the lower 48, it's just very vast, and you can get to a point of it where you just go on forever, essentially. And it's it's incredibly mountainous and, you know, thick forests. And, yeah, Joe will get into some of that. Yeah, so um, I'll I'll just jump right to some of the wildlife that's in the habitat. You have timber wolf, raccoon, moose, black bear, coyote, cougar, elk, and other forest animals. So I think the only thing missing that'd be a big predator would be brown bear or grizzlies. They're not really there. It was uh, established by Teddy Roosevelt. Some of this, if you did listen to the other episode, is repetitive, so bear with us if you listen to the other show. And if you didn't, listen to the other show. Yeah, if you didn't, (laughs) or you did, listen to it again. Why not? Yes. So uh, it was uh, on October 29th, 1934, part of the Selway National Forest was added by executive order, and that was by Teddy Roosevelt. It's very mountainous. I mean, we said a bunch of times, in the 5k to 10k or 7k range so it's it's not getting over 8,000 feet but it's extremely mountainous up and down it's very very thick forest floor and this was from several interviews that rescuers have talked about that they have multi-year deadfall and large trees making travel by a foot very hard so they haven't seen major forest fires so you have a lot of built up brush and it's hard to get through the thicker parts of the areas they even say in some spots you're not even walking on ground it's that thick just really hard to walk by foot okay so it's all down trees and brush and things like that Mm -hmm. they said with exposure without proper gear most people wouldn't be able to survive the night in the climate and the elevation in october so that's the time when he went it's it's cold there's not Mm -hmm. a lot of shelter or anything unless you can unless you're a survivalist and know how to build with all the stuff there terrence was not that you know, it's he he didn't have that type of experience. Will I I mean, we'll get into he actually was, I would say, pretty experienced in the backcountry, but he wasn't he didn't plan for that on this. Yeah, it's shoot. not like uh, Bear Grylls or that the guy yeah. who like the hippie that doesn't even wear shoes ever and can just live anywhere. So Terrence Woods at the time of the disappearance was 27 and this was two years ago this October. So he'd only be about 29 coming up this year. He weighed 130 pounds, had black hair that was shaved tight to his head. The clothing he was last seen in was not really anything that was prepared for an overnight. So, you know, long sleeve shirt, regular pants, nothing, you know, maybe a little jacket, nothing that he could really survive in. First personality, Woods went to the University of Maryland and graduated. He lived in London for several years before moving back to the area this year. Um was an experienced journalist who had traveled the world working on documentaries and television shows. So he was very, very involved in, in documentaries and TV and, and filmmaking. From the research I did, he has traveled. He, he traveled and did some uh, filming in Turkey and Alaska. And some of these shoots were you know pretty rough and remote. So, Okay, so he's got experience in those areas. He's not a city boy. You know, he, no. can, he can rough it, especially if he's doing all these shows and things like that. Correct. Yeah. So he, he was experienced. I don't know, you know, how well he was experienced, you know, if it came to survival, but he, he's been out in the back country before. Okay. So as far as medical issues, there were none that were made public. His father said he had no history of panic attacks, any mental disorders. He's been all over the planet in tough situations filming. The father spoke with people at his old job, which was ITV and his mentors, they all said there were no signs of any type of mental issues or anything that would have tipped them off. And I mm-hmm. think that's key because not that this is one of those incidences, whenever you have like an office shooting or something that, or like somebody that commits suicide in office, everyone comes out of the work woodwork and says, you know what? I, oh, I could kind of see how that was. Or like they start, they start seeing flags that they might've not noticed until the actual incident occurred. 
Yeah. So they're saying retroactively that they still don't believe there's anything off with him, really. You can say, too, though, you know, some people that have mental health issues do a really good job of hiding it from their friends and family. Okay. So, I mean, I there's no outward signs that we could find. There were interviews with his parents, family, friends, like good friends have known him for a long time, and no one ever mentioned anything about that. So, I mean, it's a good possibility that he didn't have any issues, at least not before this trip. So, um, okay. yeah, seemed like a, a young, healthy adult male. Yeah. And we, so we talked a little bit about his experience and lack thereof, but also his experience in working in those conditions. His parents were given a backpack that he did leave at the site. Inside it was a couple of camera bags, batteries, Sharpies, uh, some painkillers, cough drops, hand cream, chargers, a three inch folding tactical knife and a stun gun. So he's, he's had some stuff that I'm, he probably carries around in the back country. I did kind of laugh though. The uh, I was listening to a news report on this backpack that they found, and the the news people were like, "Well, he was prepared for the wilderness." But I was, <laughs> I'm reading the kind of the list of items in his backpack, and I'm like, oh, I, October in Idaho in the mountains, nothing there is really <laughs> to the news people. For... He was prepared that don't know <laughs> how to survive out there. They they just saw a folding knife and stun gun, and like, oh yeah, he yeah. was good. <laughs> no food, no uh, water, no. You know, no warm weather gear, nothing. Yeah. So, and outside of that, too, he also did not have any experience in the location that they were shooting at. So, he wasn't really familiar with the Nez Pierce wilderness area at all. So, uh, when they talked to his friends and his family, a couple of his friends said that he really didn't want to go on the trip based on some text messages before he left. Friends weren't shocked by the comments, but thought it was unusual after the fact. They said his behavior on the shoot didn't match what he was like in normal life. So he had a little apprehension, it sounds like, to his friends. Yeah, and once we get in the timeline, you'll kind of see kind of events leading up to his disappearance. But everything I read and researched and heard in various interviews, um, he really, for some reason, like before this trip, he kind of lived to travel and do these different shoots all over the world. And for some reason, he this one he didn't want to didn't want to go on not to bash Idaho, but maybe because he's been to all those places, he was not interested in going to Idaho. But I mean, if you, if you're like really like the back country, I mean, there's nowhere else in the U S other than Alaska that is back country like Idaho. I mean, that's, that's remote and off the grid. Now how we look at Outdoor excursions, I think, is much differently than someone who's, I would, I'm assuming, is like Terrence. Meaning, like the type of people who will go visit Machu Picchu, but yeah. not really are interested in doing backcountry Alaska. Like, yeah. the idea is they like the adventure travel, but they're not really into, like, the extreme ruggedness of it. Whereas, yeah. like, you and I would appreciate it because it's one of the biggest areas of untouched wilderness and mountainous area, and you won't run into people. Maybe yeah. he's more interested in like hot spots. You know what I'm saying? Could be. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, that's there's... that's like what popped in my head about his what what I'm imagining his personality is of he loves traveling but not mm-hmm. interested in the type of that deep rugged traveling. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I forget. I mean, I'd love to do Machu Picchu, but I also Idaho. Some of these areas in Idaho sound really cool um, mm-hmm. and challenge challenging. <laughs> and that and that's the point. I think we would love Idaho. So that's why yeah. I, I didn't want to say I want to bash Idaho, but I'm thinking from his perspective, if he's gone to all these places and lived in London and he's traveling the world, mm-hmm. Idaho is not really on anyone's top 10 list if they're going around the world. No. But to a, to a stateside backcountry backpacker like us, heck yeah it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, all right, let's go into the timeline. Okay, so uh, we have a pretty detailed timeline here of kind of events leading up to the disappearance. With this case, I'm kind of going to go into more of kind of the preamble of his disappearance just because there's kind of some weird text messages to his dad and stuff that happened before he went missing. So it all kind of starts in the fall of 2018. Terrence gets this freelance job working for the London-based production company called Raw TV and Joe. Raw TV produces one of my favorite shows on TV, Gold Rush. <laughs> Ooh, I and, like that show. 
I haven't seen and it in a I, bit, but I do like that show. It's been on TV for like 10 years now. I remember when you and I worked together years ago, we used to talk about it even. Yes. Um, but <laughs> it's uh, it's a cool show. If you My uh, my fiance hates it, so but <laughs> not for everybody. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, he got a job, a freelance job for uh, Raw TV, which is based in London. So I'm, I'm assuming he had a connection because of his time living there. Sure. And the shoot required Terrence to be out in West, the Western United States, specifically Montana and Idaho for several weeks. So it started on October 1st and it was, they're planning to conclude the second week of November. So they, this shoot was, uh, there's an offshoot of Gold Rush. Um, one of the guy. I'm probably going into Gold Rush way too much because I watch it a lot. <laughs> but there used to be a guy on the show called Dave Turin, and uh, there's an offshoot show now that he is on where he kind of goes to abandoned mines and looks for gold. So this was a shoot for that show, and they were filming at an abandoned mine called Penman Mine, which is at an elevation of about six thousand feet. It's in the Oregonde Oregonde uh, area which is part of the larger Nez Pierce Clearwater National Forest. It's also kind of near Elk City. So the, the production team was using Elk City as kind of a base camp okay. while they were shooting. So Terrence gets this job in the fall. Uh, fast forward to September 30th, 2018. This would be the last time Terrence Sr., that's Terrence's dad, would ever see him. He drops him off at an airport in Maryland. Terrence is flying from Maryland to Montana first. So now it's October 1st. So from October 1st to October 5th, uh, Terrence was in Montana. So from landing at the airport to Friday morning on the 5th, Terrence was in Montana. During this time, Terrence was in good spirits. He was texting his dad pictures of the scenery and then, you know, telling him on the phone that everything was fine. Okay. So he's just taking in the sights of Montana, which even just driving through Montana is gorgeous. Yeah, it's amazing uh, countryside. And um, so even up until right before his disappearance, he still was in good spirits. Okay. Um, so now it is 10.58 p.m. Idaho time on October 4th. So this is Thursday. Terrence sends his dad a text. The text just reads, hey, dad, just got to the hotel in Idaho. So nothing, they've left nothing my... Nothing crazy. No, nothing crazy. They uh, they left uh, Montana. They're in Idaho now. Now it's twelve fifty eight a.m. Idaho time. Now it's ten October fifth. So Terrence texts his dad a video. It's the video has no words or any talking. It's just a serene river cutting its way through a rocky canyon. There there was no text, no locator or words or any clues on it. And then a, a weird weird thing later on when I was. A Washington DC news crew was doing an investigation on this disappearance. The, a reporter who was interviewing his dad saw the video and she remarked how it was really creepy and foreboding now that she knows the whole case. Yeah. Um, I wonder just, if that's like uh, a bias because of knowing what it happened might be. To him. It, yeah, it definitely could be in the, in the investigation, they kind of go in the more detail on the video. There's like steam coming up and it, I don't know. It, it sounded kind of, creepy sure so now it's 3 a.m idaho time terrence calls his dad so this is strange uh terrence calls his dad to tell him that he made it here and he's okay there was not much more said and his dad just said let's talk later in the day so now the film crew was at elk city idaho let's let that's weird so just after an hour after midnight from the day he arrived the day prior now it's midnight it's like an hour later he sends a video of a river Yep. And then at three in the morning, he calls him to say, I made it here. And that's yeah. following a text from the previous day at 11 p.m. roughly saying, hey, dad, just got into the hotel. Yeah. Was he um, known for so- like sleepwalking or sleep talking or something or? No. And um, I know they didn't make mention of it, but that that's no. Weird. And that is weird. And it, it maybe he who knows? I think you kind of. Read as I keep reading, you'll see there's kind of a a string of weird. He's acting weird the last kind of twelve hours before his disappearance. Okay. So, like I said, three a.m. He calls his dad. His dad briefly talks to him and says, 
you know, let's talk more later in the day. So now it's 5.44 a.m. Idaho time. So I'm wondering if Terrence has even slept all night. Um, a lot of, you know, texting and calling. Yeah. So Terrence texts his dad again and says, I'm coming home on Wednesday the 10th. And that was it. And so Wednesday the 10th would be October 10th. And it was noted that this would be cutting his short his trip short by several weeks, something that his friends and family said Terrence has never done before. So, like we said, the shoot was supposed to go into the second week of November. Yeah, and that's and like he hasn't even been on set yet, it sounds like. Well, they have been filming. So I believe oh, they, okay. they've been filming in different spots. So Okay, so it, it had, made it sound like he like landed and like kind of made his way through Montana and then was no. arriving. So he was with the film crew in Montana and okay, they're probably like filming the way there, like the B roll type I, stuff. I, I believe so. Yeah. So they haven't filmed at Penman mine yet from my understanding. So he sends this text to his dad. His dad doesn't respond back until 3 p.m. Idaho time. But by 3 p.m., Terrence and the crew have been out in the wilderness filming in a location that had no cell service. So Terrence Sr. isn't even sure that Terrence received that final text message. So they, they don't know. Fast forward to the end of the shoot on October 5th. So it wasn't clear the exact timing of this. It was either late afternoon or early evening. I do know it was before, you know, like 640 ish. And uh, we'll get into that later, but they have a 911 call log. But so October 5th, the crew spent the entire day filming in the mountainous area of Penman mine. Uh, and what happens next is entirely unexplainable. And what I'm about to read is, uh, first-hand knowledge from the on-site production manager that goes by the name Simon. We don't have a last name to it. And Simon later later the next day calls Terrence Sr. to kind of tell him this. But I thought it's important to kind of put this in the timeline when it happened. So uh, Simon recalls. So this is directly what Simon was saying. So we were finishing up for the day, and your son was talking to one of the miners. I was in one of the vehicles doing some work when your son told the miner that he had to go relieve himself. Something told me, kind of like a gut feeling, to look over near the cliff where your son was at. When I looked over there, all I saw was the radio lying on the ground. I originally thought your son fell off the cliff, so I leaped out of the vehicle and ran over there immediately. To my shock, your son was already 15 feet down the cliff running like a hare. I've never seen anyone run that fast. At that point, I yelled to the crew to get in a vehicle and go to the main road. I proceeded down the cliff after your son, but he kept running. Due to, due to my professional search and rescue training, I stopped running after him out of fear that he'd be further scared. So I went back topside and talked to the crew who hadn't found your son on the main road. At this point, we found the first house with a phone and reported your son missing. Uh, later on, you'll find out a local woman from Elk City was also with the film crew that day, and her name was Sherry, mm-hmm. and she corroborated the story that Simon said, Okay. and the law enforcement of the area feels that she's a very credible witness. She's a lifelong resident of Elk City, had no relationship with anybody in the film crew before they showed up, so they, they feel like the story's pretty legit. Um, so... Uh, and it was also reported earlier before Terrence ran off the cliff that he was acting strangely and was noticeably quiet. Uh, and it was also reported that his cell phone was with him at the time he ran into the woods. So wow. uh, a lot of times we always make the comment that all these people go missing and they never have their cell phone with them. And uh, if you have your cell phone with you, even if you're in an area with no signal, there's sometimes you will ping a tower and all it takes is one of those pings and you know if they can get access to your phone they can they can sometimes trace you know pretty accurately yeah, where you were where it is or at least say hey it pinged this one tower and that means it's within yeah. this radius yeah they could even do a radius of the tower they and they'd be like all right well he's somewhere in here so yeah. um it's interesting later on we'll get to why uh people were mad the that they didn't use that data. So it's 6.41 p.m. on October 5th. And the one of the reporters from the news crew doing the investigation got the call log transcript from the Idaho County Sheriff's Office. And it, it reads the following. 
advised that a male Terrence Wood, 27 from London, works for a TV company who is creating a movie in the area of Penman Mine. Never been in the woods, no guns, Terrence has been having a really hard time emotionally and had a mental breakdown earlier today. Dark complexion and light clothes. Terrence is not going to respond back to responders per reporter. Terrence does not have communication. There are people searching for him. And uh, the call log. So this is strange because it brings up the fact that someone is claiming that he had an emotionally hard day and had a mental breakdown. Yeah. Though when you talk to, you know, when they talk to Simon, that he never mentioned that. When Simon talked to Terrence Sr., he never said anything about like Terrence having a bad day. Like maybe he was day. having a bad day and told one person on the crew, and that's the guy who called 911 or something? Or Yeah, and I believe um, something. So later on, we find out that the person who actually made the 911 call log was not present at the the filming location. And the guy actually admitted to embellishing some of what he said in the call. Oh, geez. So... Was There's it like even the guy more... at the house they found? Because they said they went to a house to make the call. It might be. I I was gonna. I have it written down in my notes somewhere. Um, but yeah. It so muddies the waters. The person, it really muddies the waters because you have you have people on the crew that said he was fine, you know, acting a little strange and quiet. You have a nine one one call log that says he has a mental breakdown. Um, you have family and friends saying that he's never had any issues, you know, mental health issues. So it's really. Uh, puzzling yeah so fast forward well so this disappearance happens obviously they they call the authorities and a a search and rescue starts i'll get into that in a second um but and they're they're actually like this is after um episodes 22's disappearance right or what did he episode 20 20 yeah excuse me and no so this this was four hours before Connie was reported missing. Okay, it was before. Okay, that's what I'm trying to think of how, yeah. that, how it connects. All right, go on. Sorry. Yeah, so uh, the evening of the 5th, a massive search and rescue operation uh, started. It involved multiple counties and law enforcement agencies. They had search crews on ATVs circling the area. They had multiple dog teams out in the woods. They had helicopters with heat sensing technology in the air, so they were they were combing the 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 mountainside uh, with these helicopters they also had crews on horseback it came up several times that the conditions of the area were extremely difficult to search due to the rugged terrain um one of the searchers actually said you couldn't even walk through there all the down trees in the brush um and then by midweek the search and rescue operation was hampered by heavy rain and snow in the high mountains and they couldn't get the helicopters in there so um, it's really interesting. You've got this huge expanse of space, tough to search, bad weather, which is a, we see this again and again in some of these searches where the weather hampers the, the search and rescue operation. Sure. Maybe it's coincidental. I don't know. All of that kicks off on the fifth <clears throat> and then Saturday morning on the sixth, Simon, the production manager for raw TV calls Terrence senior to tell him his son is missing. And he also kind of, this is interesting. He also kind of gives a little additional information about Terrence himself. So Simon tells Terrence senior, Terrence came highly recommended to us and was our first pick. When I met your son though, he didn't live up to my standards. Uh, when I asked him to do different things, he didn't know how to do them. And uh, he said there were a lot of other things that his son did not do. So <clears throat> this is, again, doesn't jive with what the family and friends have been saying about Terrence. Yeah, and it sounds like if this guy could have been, I don't want to slander, but I'm saying like, he could have been like a hard-ass film boss type guy. So maybe Terrence screwed yeah. something up and he yelled at him and he didn't take it well. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm just trying to think Who of knows? something. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough because um, Raw TV uh, didn't let any of the crew talk to uh, law enforcement or the reporters or the family. So that's strange. They've been. It's been really hard for. Yeah, it is. It is very strange. So the family, Terrence Senior specifically, m- makes a lot of mention that he, they just wanted to talk to 
some of the people that were at the, the film site that day. And the company has barred any of them from talking and none of them respond on social media. And so it, it's odd. Yeah, whether, whether they're um, guilty or not, that makes them look guilty. The optics on that are horrible. Yeah, I, I'd love I don't to know why. why. Yeah, I mean, was there some kind of accident caused by the film crew that killed Terrence? <laughs> ooh, <laughs> and we'll get into theories. Ooh, yeah, stop right now. Uh, you're, you're, <laughs> we got to get into that. Um, so we'll get into theories later. There's a lot of weird theories out there, too. Like I said, search and rescue operation kicked off that evening of the 5th, and uh, the I- Idaho County Sheriff's Department started to scale the search back on the 11th, so about seven days of searching, and they had found nothing, no trace of what happened to Terrence. No prints, no scent, nothing. So they were kind of like, you know, we... And at, and by this time, the 11th, they're also dealing with two other disappearances in the same county. So Connie and then another gentleman we'll talk about a little later that went missing that Sunday. So their resources are really strained right now. Um, and it's, you know, it's always sad when they start these, you know, the taper these searches off. Um, but they can't go on forever, yeah. obviously. Um, so... During the search, a couple interesting tidbits here. It was reported that at some point during the search, law enforcement officials went to Simon's room to make sure it was locked. However, uh, it looked like people had already been inside his room to, they said, supposedly get articles of clothing for the tracking dogs. So you've got a weird case of people were in his room before law enforcement were able to get there. Um And then this is interesting as well. It was also reported uh, by the news media that law enforcement never asked for Terrence's cell phone records and never did a search of uh, his laptop's history. And they said both would have required going to a judge and getting a subpoena, which would require evidence of a crime or that he is endangered. Law enforcement officials at the time concluded evidence showed Terrence intended to disappear. Many were shocked that this never happened. People familiar with cases like this said it would not have been hard to get the proper authority to do the searches. So Wow, it's like they just just assumed it's like they he just ran off care. on purpose, like we're not gonna waste our time on this. Yeah, it, it's um they interviewed a lady who does these, you know, investigates these kind of searches, and she said it, it was kind of shocking that they didn't at least try to get cell phone records. Yeah. To see if they could ping a location of where he might be or yeah, see if you he feel was like texting anyone. I feel like they could get his dad's permission. Instead, like even not even to get a warrant, just saying like, "Hey, like I give you permission to well, do it." Or they maybe said, not. Um, "No, I think because he's 27, his dad would have to have power of attorney or something like that in order to authorize that." Oh wow! You so you have to go to a judge for it. But, but what judge would they, turn that down? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, like this lady was saying that investigates searches like this. She said it wouldn't be too hard to convince a judge to issue that subpoena in a case where you're trying to find someone that's critical, you know, missing in an environment that every hour counts. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cause it's, it's, it's more of a missing person's case than a runaway. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you look at all the evidence, yes, he did run into the woods, but if you look at all of the other evidence about Terrence, it, it, that is not in his character to do. Well, And that mixed with the nine one one call saying there was some form of mental instability. You could easily claim he's mentally incapable of knowing what he was doing, which poses a danger to himself, which I would argue yeah. gives them some level of authority to say, yeah, let's, let's at least look at his location record so we can help find this guy. Cause if he's mentally incompetent at that point, he could die and do harm yep. to himself. So uh, I'll wrap up the timeline here with two conflicting statements by law enforcement. Perfect. So, <laughs> <laughs> So we have an inter- the first statement we have is an interview with the local sheriff that was um, in charge of the search and rescue operation at the time, and he he said the local uh, the local sheriff said that the guy is working the SAR operation will tell you that Terrence is not in this area the area that we searched they determined that he slid down the bank and made it to the road after that they don't know where he would have gone they said if he was hurt or injured they would have found him and if he had done something fatal the dogs would have found him. So the sheriff was very confident in saying that, listen, we searched this whole area. 
if he was here, we would have found him. If he killed him, you know, killed himself or was injured, we would have found him. The dogs would have found him. He was very confident in that. I listened to the interview. You can you can hear it on the internet. And he kind of he's one of those Western guys. He's very, you know, straight to the point. Sure. And he was it, you'll learn that the family of Terrence and the sheriff's department do not see eye to eye. They actually don't talk. They're not like at one point the sheriff's department said we're done communicating with the Woods family. And uh, the sheriff basically is saying, he's like, listen, whatever caused your son to run into the woods is not our problem. You called us. We looked for him. He's not here. What do you want us to do about it? Oh, that wow. was kind of, yeah, that was kind of his super l- compassionate. Just, yeah. Well, and he was, he was trying to make the point. He's like, listen, this is a huge Idaho County is huge. He said there's two people per square mile, 8,500 square miles. He's like, that's 16,000 people. He's like, it's huge. He's like, we had three searches going on at the same time. And he, you could tell he was frustrated and he was kind of, you know, he's a grizzly old sheriff in a, you know, the high, the high mountains of the West. <laughs> yeah. So he, uh, you know, that was his side of it. However, they did another interview with a different officer and the officer said, he was shocked someone could get out of the area. He said the forest floor is thick with deadfall of lodgepole and Douglas firs that have toppled down on each other year upon year. The officer described it as trying to run through giant pickup sticks. Some parts so thick with deadfall that your feet won't even touch the ground. So this other officer is completely shocked. Anyone would be able to hike out of there very far. You've got, you know, two conflicting people say you know one thinks he's gone and the other is like how did he get out of here so it just adds this whole case is just conflicting stories okay so i'm gonna get into a theory here i want to just kind of wrap up everything so he gets he gets to montana they're kind of filming as they're traveling on their way to idaho he's texting his dad normally then all of a sudden when they arrive in idaho uh late at night around 11 o'clock he just sends hey i'm here Made it normal text. I would argue like, hey, I'm going to bed. Got here. Just letting you know. Done. But then for some reason around 1 o'clock in the morning, he texts a video of a river, which, okay, no big deal. But then at 3, he calls his dad to say he made it there okay. Yep. Which is weird because he already told him he was there. Yeah. So now you have that stuff. Dad says, hey, we'll talk in the morning. Um, He calls again, right, at like 5? Or he texts him? Uh, he texts him and says he's coming back now. He's cutting oh, he's, his trip short okay. by several weeks, yeah. So based on that, I'm, I'm going to go a couple different levels here. Based on that and then how they wouldn't let the film crew talk to him and how Simon was acting, it sounds like he was either screwing up or at least screwing up in the eyes of Simon on the days shooting prior to getting to Idaho. Now this yeah. is all this is all my this is me making up a story. So none of this is fact. This is me assuming things just to let the listeners know. Yeah. I wonder if he gets to Idaho and he knows like he's getting fired or cut from the set early and it's bugging him. So he can't sleep. Uh-huh. He's texting his dad. He doesn't want to like bring his dad in on it, but he's kind of in his head about it. Whatever happened is messing him up a bit. Maybe the guy said, mm-hmm. "You know what? I want you out of here by Wednesday. You can finish up these last few days." I'm assuming they get paid on a daily basis if it's like a side gig type thing. So maybe yeah, like freelance work. Or- yeah. So maybe they just said, you know what? I'll keep you on till Wednesday, but we're, you're doing a terrible job. I hate you. What You know, just being a, <laughs> just being a jerk. To, I'm just assuming again, this, this, the yeah. Simon guy could be the nicest guy in the world. So I don't want anyone to like freak out, but I'm just making up a, a story here that might make sense. So he already knows he's done. He texts Des, Hey, I'm coming home Wednesday, trying to be upbeat, but maybe he's really bent out of shape about it. And then he's just in his head. Maybe he's getting yelled at still while they're filming, and he just cracks on that day of filming. Like maybe he just snapped and just ran off into the into the into the like screw this crap and just couldn't. Like I've seen videos of employees. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but like I've been yelled at by People managers. Snap. Yeah, I've been yelled at. Yeah. I don't care. Like yeah, they're gonna yell at me. I might be like, oh, what a jerk. But like if I'm not doing my job and I get yeah, right. yelled at when I was younger, I'd be like, oh, maybe I need to do a little bit better of a job. Um, <laughs> and if it was somebody I didn't like, I'd quit my job. But I've also seen yeah. people that like literally lose their mind, like break down if they're not doing a good job and their managers don't like them. So if he mm-hmm. was of the type of person where he needed to feel like he was 
be doing a good job and feel like he was contributing and he wasn't getting any of that from his manager, maybe he snapped and ran off. All right, I'm going to cut there, and I want to hear what you okay. think. Because I, I have theories, different <clears throat> theories after that, the running part. So I I kind of I have a, a several theories, and I kind of group them from most explainable to absolutely crazy. And some of the crazy ones in this this case are are really interesting. I am excited to talk about them. We'll we'll get to that in a Ooh, second. Okay. <laughs> so I think the I think there's four m- explainable reasons of you know for what happened to Terrence. I think theory number one is like you were saying, either you know suicide or mental breakdown. Um, there are so the police gave so he had a journal that was in his room. And the police, the law enforcement read through it and they dismissed it as indecipherable rants and gave it back to his parents. His parents showed it to the news reporters and there were several mentions of the phrase Great Reset in the journal towards the end of the entries. So he mentioned... Well, you left this part out of the story. <laughs> well, I mean, I wanted to save it to the end. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> so um, he writes... He was tired of traveling and was ready to head back home and settle down. Um, several entries in the journal. Uh, he was tired of London life. He was tired of the travel. He he kept referring it to the Great Reset. So you can see in his journal that he's having some kind of anguish with the way his life is currently. Okay. Um, it's like having like a don't quarter know, life crisis. Quarter life crisis. He's sick of all this travel. He he was talking about. He ranted about the kind of the celebrity lifestyle in London. He didn't like it and all of that kind of stuff. So I think, I think suicide and mental breakdown is a very explainable theory. A lot of people suffer from mental health issues, and you can be really close friends or family with them, and you don't even know it until something happens. Sure, you hear about it all the time. They seem normal on the outside. On the inside, they're, uh, you know they have serious issues. So I think that, you know, he could have been just standing on that cliff, kind of looking off into the, you know, the mountains and just said F it and just started running. Okay. You know, not even think so that I think that's, um, theory. Number one, theory, number two, drug use. Now there's really no mention of any type of drug abuse or drug use in any of the research I did. He did have he did make mention in his journal that he was sick of drug use. It didn't have a context. I don't know if he was like maybe his friends in London. He was sick of that environment. Okay, but like like they they didn't find any in his backpack outside of the over the counter painkillers. No, nope. like Tylenol. Yeah, it was like Tylenol or Advil or something. Okay. and yeah, there was no reference by family or friends that he was a drug user. But I don't think you can rule out. Some people have really wild reactions to, you know, acid or psychedelics or, you know, things like that. Is it outside the realm of possibility that someone on the filming crew? Yeah, had... or even like cocaine? Yeah, I mean, I guess. I don't know that. I, I'm trying to think of, some, you know, mind-altering drugs that would maybe scare you and cause you to run. Sure. Something like acid, okay. I guess. And I, I've never done acid, like so I don't know. mushrooms, any any type of psychedelic. Any type of mind altering drug that might cause somebody to maybe if they have an underlying mental condition to snap. So I don't think maybe, you know, maybe it's not outside the realm of possibility. Maybe he made friends with someone on the crew that had acid with him or who knows. Sure. I'm I there's no evidence of this. OK, so I'm not I'm not slandering him. I'm just saying I think you can't rule it out. Yep. It's explainable. Yep. That would be explainable. Yep. No, I'm with you. Yeah. So I think third possibility. Uh, he developed a fear of somebody on the crew. Somebody maybe was verbally or physically abusive to him or threatened him. Mm-hmm. And he just got so scared that he, he ran off and maybe he was going to run off and had a plan to like get to the road or something and got lost. Um, I think, you know, maybe that's maybe not as explainable. Um, it would maybe be the reason why they didn't let the crew talk to anyone. I mean, okay. I I still don't understand why the crew wasn't allowed to speak with anybody. It makes it seem like something happened between him and the crew. Yeah, that that's that's the big thing that I didn't get into. So like up until that point, it's like okay, he might be having these issues. Fine, 
And yeah. Simon does the story of he's a production manager and he's like, all right, I'm going to be the one that talks to people. Everyone shut your trap. Sounds yeah. like they're trying to get their story straight. But it would be hard to keep, you know, to silence 12 people plus that lady from town. You know, you would think somebody would say something. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, that's another explainable possibility. Then uh, for my fourth explainable, I put exposure. And this would be kind of like a sub theory. If one of the other three happened, I think it would be highly likely that he would suffer from exposure based on how he was dressed. And I, I just I learned a new term. I didn't I didn't know of this. I we've talked about paradoxical undressing. Yep. Um, but apparently people who are in severe hypothermia also do something called terminal burrowing. Uh, so oh, like they, they go to ground. They'll they'll go to ground level and they'll like try to burrow under like logs or like dig a hole or like go into like a cave area. Like they try to get into like a burrow, <laughs> and it searchers search and rescue teams that search for people in you know, cold climates, they actually talk about this quite often because it makes it harder for you to find the people. Yeah. Even if they've passed, they, they'll they still be alive while they're burrowing in, and then it makes it really hard for people to find their remains. Maybe he, for whatever reason, went out into the wilderness and he suffered severe hypothermia and then burrowed down because we said it was real thick Yeah, and he could just be like deep under a bunch of deadfall and you're not yeah. going to find someone like that. It doesn't explain why, movie. yeah, why the tracking dogs might not find him, but... Yeah, that doesn't it, explain because if you're doing that, you're definitely shedding your scent and skin and things like that, and they're searching yep. right away without yeah, any hindrance, so you think they'd be able to find them right away, but... Yeah, so I think if if one of the other explainable theories happened, I think exposure would become a major issue for him. One of the theories I think is possible, but not highly likely, would be animal attack. Anytime there's predators wherever you're hiking, you know, it's a possibility. But these predators really aren't, you know, black bears are probably not going to attack them. Mm -hmm. There would be, we always say this, there would be evidence. You'd see evidence of an attack. No, 100% agree. I think that, like, if there's an animal attack, it makes it, it's unfortunate, but it makes it easier to find. Yeah, so possible Likely, probably not. Yeah. Um, less likely, I said, murder by one of the crew. I think this is just less likely because this is a high-profile film crew working for the Discovery Channel, mm-hmm. filming a major TV show. I just, if somebody on the crew murdered somebody, I think that would be like headline news. Yeah, we would have heard about it. Well, and yeah, I yeah, I th- it would have came out by now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, especially uh, with that Gold many Rush people. Is, Gold Rush is one of their most popular Discovery Channel's popular shows. Um, yeah, so I think it's a theory, but I think it's very unlikely. So now we get into two of the crazy theories. <laughs> yeah, this is what I'm interested in: the unrealistic, but I mean, technically plausible because you can't prove them wrong. <laughs> yeah. So uh, of course, I found both of these theories, um, you know, deep diving through Reddit. And I, at first I'm like that this isn't real. And then I, you know, I did more research and they're actually pseudoscience to back up some of these theories. But, uh, the first theory is called call of the void. So this actually is more of a real theory than the, the next one panic in the woods. (laughs) Sounds like a band call of the void is also known as high place phenomena. Uh, it says since people often feel it when standing somewhere high up, you could also experience this type of impulse when doing other things that involve a high risk of danger. For example, Call of the Void can involve thoughts or urges to jerk the steering wheel and turn into oncoming traffic while driving, jumping into a very deep uh, deep water from a boat or bridge, uh, stand on train or subway tracks or jump in front of a train, cut yourself when holding a knife or sharp object, uh, put metal objects into electrical outlets, or stick your hand into fire or a garbage disposal. So they say, yeah, they say when these urges come up in normal people, you quickly counter them, telling yourself you'd never do that. You know what would happen in any of those scenarios, but you still think about doing it, however quickly the thought passes. Sure. And I I read this, and I actually, I used to commute, you know, to when I worked with you all the time, you know, on the freeway, 
and every once in a while you do get a weird <laughs> urge like you see that big pillar on the side of the road you're like oh what if i just <laughs> and then you're like what are you talking about <laughs> mike are you okay <laughs> you know what i think of uh tommy boy i just want to jerk <laughs> the wheel into a gt bridge embankment <laughs> when he's freaking out that he can't get any sales oh man okay. so uh, uh, I think that's an interesting theory. If somebody has an underlying mental health issue, yeah, if he's already teetering on the edge and then he gets that to hit him at the worst yeah. pot, like perfect storm, I don't yep. see that. I don't say that's very crazy because I've kind of heard of that before. I never heard of what it was called, but I've heard about it in yeah. reference to really high places, like the urge to like push a friend off a cliff. I always think about that when we go hiking. I'm like, does Mike <laughs> want to push me off this cliff right now? Like you think about it, you would never do it yeah. ever. But like it yep. crosses your mind for a split second. You almost are embarrassed that you think about it. But yeah. I've, I've read about that in like outside magazine. That's just a weird, it's a weird phenomenon that we have. Yeah. So if you are already a little unstable, you got a lot of crap going on. It take my earlier theory to heart. And then all of a sudden he's going to take a leak off this cliff. He's just like, screw it. And just jumps and just starts. Sprint. <laughs> yeah. Like he just, he loses it. He snaps. Yeah, I could see that as a as a plausible theory. Yeah, so I, I it's an interesting theory. I'd never really heard of it before, but I kind of when it it went into kind of what you're thinking in those places. Like we've all been hiking where you're you're kind of on a cliff and you're looking over and <laughs> yeah. So that is, I guess that's not as crazy as I thought. Yeah. The next one, the next one's crazy. Okay. This theory is called uh, Panic in the Woods, and according to the blog, the Paranormal Guide. So you already know where it's going. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Panic in the woods has been associated with the pagan god Pan, protector of wild places, whose unseen presence inspires causeless terror. Victims experience an overwhelming feeling of paranoia, such as a sinister forest nearby, and in sense a sense of imminent danger. This usually leads to the person to flee the area, desperately seeking out civilization. One common characteristic of panic is that people often describe that the woodlands will go completely silent, silent, deafening the witness before the loud pitch sound sets in a few moments later. Deafening silence and paranoia in the woods are related to the real life cryptid goat man and another group of paranormal paranormal monsters known as the skinwalkers i think we talked about we them talked about episode. skinwalkers in the episode <laughs> and i've actually been in the woods where i've had it go completely silent and it is terrifying because yeah. when you're out in the woods even when it's peaceful but you if you yeah. really start to focus there's a lot of sound happening Yep, and, and I th I've read it somewhere. Uh, a funny statement of saying like it's basically the sound of billions of insects mating. Like, like, but like, <laughs> but that's kind of like it's funny when you put it that way because when you really listen, yeah. it's just lots of low le level noise. It's like low level white noise, or I think they call it black noise when it's not high pitched. But, mm -hmm. but I've been in the woods several times, either hunting or hiking, where it goes silent, where everything yeah. stops, and it is. Terrifying, even if it's during the day, because yeah. like your brain can't process it. Like you don't know you were listening to noise, but then all of a sudden there's nothing, and it, yeah. it really messes with your head. And you know that could be kind of maybe it's related to human psychology. Sure. That when you're alone out, you know, in the woods, may, your brain tends to, you know, maybe wander and kind of come up with these fantasies and maybe for normal people it doesn't turn into anything but maybe just like so you're the saying other i'm theory. not a normal person is that <laughs> well no you don't I'm just kidding. You, I'm you, kidding. yeah you haven't run off in the woods and disappeared yeah <laughs> but maybe for somebody who's unstable it causes them like the other theories to snap yeah like if i was uh, there right now because i'm losing my mind with six kids stuck <laughs> in a house like if all of a sudden i'm just gonna just gonna run just to start running yeah, so uh, those are my crazy theories. And I know we got to probably wrap this up quick because we're, we're running longer. Just to really quickly go into law enforcement theory, they thought he had a panic attack or mental breakdown. Yeah, and, and that, that kind of plays into what we were just talking about, really, if you think about yep. it. Uh, theory law enforcement uh, had was that he wanted to get lost. Uh, they don't know if he was suicidal, but they think something happened to cause him to run into the woods mentally you know, he's gone. They looked for him, couldn't find him. Uh, the family, the family suspects foul play. 
Uh, they, they said the sheriff and the crew were very unhelpful. They think he was in an uncomfortable situation trying to get away. The parents have hinted that they think race played a role in this. Um, the father went on a radio station, basically accused the detective of being racist. So I'm sure that played into them saying, you know what, we're not interested in really investigating anymore if they're going to attack and, us. And it's just like when you start getting emotion in both yeah. sides, like you you end up getting both sides not making good decisions. I And I honestly don't blame the father for saying that. If you read the more detailed investigation about the case, all of the, the roadblocks and the, you know, the sheriff, you know, not get, you know, getting the cell phone data and, you know, to Terrence senior seemingly not caring about the investigation, you might get that feeling. Yeah. I, I don't blame him for saying that the sheriff responded in an email vehemently denying that race played any issue in the investigation. and basically said, we're done talking to your family on this going forward, like communications off. Yeah. Um, so, you know, just a lot of raw emotion. I don't blame, you know, I think the people conducting the search and rescue operation, we've said this in lots of cases, they always try their hardest to find the people. Yeah. You know, that's their number yeah, one goal. I think and they feel terrible I think when they don't find someone. there's bad people out there, but as a whole, the majority of people are good. Yeah. So when you get enough um, people involved, you're not going to have a bunch of people just not caring about this kid that ran off, especially when you have a whole team of search and rescue people. That's their one job. It's what they wake up for. So they're going to give yep. it their all. So to wrap this all up, the final theory is I, it's not really a theory. I'm just, I think what if something more mysterious happened in this kind of 72 hour period? Because as four hours after Terrence went missing, uh, Connie Johnson went missing just uh, north of there uh, near Fog Mountain. Yep. And obviously we, episode 20 covers that case. So if you've not listened to it, you should do that right away after this episode. Absolutely. <laughs> She disappeared four hours after Terrence did. Then on October 7th, so this is Sunday at approximately 5.30 p.m., Idaho County Sheriff's Office was advised of another overdue person, 42-year-old uh, Jose Mendez Morales of Tacoma, Washington. He left his residence and was going to Elk City, I Idaho. Jose checked in with his family from Grangeville on September 25th, but no one had heard from him since. He normally checks in three days uh, every three days. So uh, he went missing in the Elk City area on October 7th at 5.30 p.m. That's when the law enforcement was um, notified. And strangely enough, earlier that year in April, uh, four hunters uh, went over the side of a road in their SUV into a river, and uh, two of the hunters' bodies were recovered, but the other two are still missing to this day as well. Um, wow. So there's in, like in that in area, the too. area, there's like something going on. Yeah. So Ooh, you Lon know what, you know, what? I do have to say this because I, I like, as I have, I've been saying the last couple episodes, I'm, I'm tearing through the X-Files right now. Mm, yes. I think that there is some government installation somewhere in that wilderness <laughs> and they're testing high frequency wavelength mind control oh, and they're running go. tests and it's affecting people <laughs> of a certain blood type within a certain radius to yeah. all be attracted to the tower. Huh. That well, is, there that you is go. my X Files. We need Fox that's Mulder and Dana Scully on the case. That's crazier than any of the theories I know. I've read. <laughs> um, I will wrap this up with saying that law enforcement reinsured everyone that none of these cases were connected. Which but just makes you feel like they're all connected just because they reassured yeah. us they're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it, it's funny because they, they've been telling all the families, they've been discouraging the families coming to come to Idaho to help, or, you know, to inquire about. See, the, that's the weird. And, and I, I don't want to make it sound like, cause we, we, we laugh and goof on the show. I do. We do take this seriously. I don't yeah. like the way they're responding to these cases. And I don't know if it's just that law enforcement agency and they're all just a bunch of jerks, but it makes it extremely curious to me yeah. that they are either not interested in investigating this at all or they're actively t like pushing people away from attempting to find their loved ones and that is suspicious that is very suspicious like i can understand like hey like we're not going to be able to help you if you want to come walk around in the woods be my guest it's a free country yeah but to actively try and like repulse people from coming there it that just raised red flags to me that that is a big red flag the only thing i can think of is 
it, they're probably so short staffed. They're dealing with three disappearances. They're probably like, if we have all these people coming out here, we're going to be looking for more missing people. And that, like, and maybe, that could be totally the human element of it. It's like, yeah. they've probably never dealt with this ever. And then all of a sudden in the same year, they have these major operations. They're not prepared to do it. You have one of the family members calling them a racist and saying like, you know, cause these families are frustrated. Maybe the sheriffs yep. are, fr- everyone's starting to get emotional and it's just not a good mix. It's not good juju for what's going on. And yeah, on, on the flip side of that coin though, if your job's law enforcement, you got to suck it up, bucko. And optics yeah. are very important and that's your job. And if you can't handle yep. that stress, then maybe you shouldn't be doing that job. You know, the, yeah, the no. family, the family's job isn't to be calm and composed. There's, I'm not saying their job's supposed to panic, but guess what? Yeah. If any of my kids go missing, no matter what age there is, I'm not going to be rational. Maybe, you know <laughs> what I mean? I'm not, I'm not yeah. because I'm going to be emotional. I'm going to be a nervous wreck. I'm going to be losing it. So I might yeah. say things that might offend you. And yep. Like I, I was a paramedic. They're the trained I, professionals. Yeah, I had a, I was a paramedic. <laughs> I had people screaming at me and doing weird things to me. And you know what I had to do? Treat them with respect and help them. Whether and yeah. and just in my head, I always told myself, hey, you know, if I had a drug addict, like this guy doesn't mean it. He literally is on drugs. Like you can't yeah. take that stuff personally. So it's I hate putting motives in people's heads, but it's there's so many instances of them kind of pushing this stuff off. Where yep. on its face, it seems shady to me. And I don't like yeah. that. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. That's exactly. It's kind of no, like, I, yeah. You know, why why isn't the crew allowed to talk to people? Why didn't they go after the cell phone data for Terrence? Why, are, why is the local law enforcement actively encouraging the family not to show up there? Yeah. It's kind of like one thing. Okay. Two things starting to get weird. Three, four, five, six, seven instances of something. Okay. Now I'm curious. Start answering my questions. Yeah. Why is the sheriff say one thing and another officer say the completely opposite thing? Yeah. You know, it, none of it, there's so many conflicting reports and facts yep. and uh yeah and i do have to check myself because i mean i love movies and tv and your brain immediately yeah. starts to make this giant cool <laughs> cons- <laughs> like hollywood conspiracy out of it and i understand that that's not real life but yeah you also look at you know declassified documents for certain things it's not real life but you bet your ass they've attempted weird shit in the past yeah so i well i i definitely think you could make a movie out of like all these different disappearances in this area yeah like it could be a pretty cool thriller. Down yeah, the road, absolutely. Maybe. Well, I, I say I say we leave it at that. We want your opinion, so um, definitely yes. Charles, especially you're the one that sent us this. If you have an opinion on this, please email it to us. We'll post it online if you give us permission. We, we'd love to hear what you think. Um, mm-hmm. For everyone else, thanks again for tuning into our show. We appreciate all of you for listening and sharing locations unknown with your friends and family. Uh, be sure to like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We also have our YouTube channel where we'll upload uh, the audio of these shows as well as other national park videos. Sometimes we'll share some of our personal uh, videos and trips as well as other video content. And if you'd like to support the show, uh, visit us on our Facebook store and buy some cool swag. Otherwise, you can donate to our Patreon account. Uh, And remember, when enjoying the beauty of nature, whether backpacking, camping, or just taking a walk, always remember to leave no trace. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.